As I stood in front of the mirror, I happened to glance out at the landscape outside the window and was struck by a brief sensation. It was a sense of something having been lost. Hello and welcome to my second video on the books of Simon Stalenhag, the Swedish artist and world builder who gave us Tales from the Loop, Things from the Flood, The Electric State and The Labyrinth, the first of which is now an Amazon Prime TV series. Now first off, you should go and watch the first entry in my video series, I will put the link here and in the description, as in this video I will be looking into Things from the Flood, and this book is a direct sequel to Tales from the Loop. So it really is worth familiarising yourself with that one first. Secondly, as per my Tales from the Loop video, I am only looking at the book. I am avoiding all interviews, analysis and media outside of the pages of Things from the Flood. As a result, I will miss stuff. I will misinterpret the author's intent constantly and I may reach conclusions that are very different and silly from others, but that is the fun of this kind of experiment. What I will be trying to do in this video is identify interesting elements regarding the ideologies on display, the themes that speak to me, and to use the text and images of the book to try and flesh out Stalinag's fictional world, how it all works, and why that might be interesting to me. Now. Whereas Tales from the Loop is a nostalgic sci-fi setting based in 1980s Sweden, Things from the Flood takes us into the 90s Sweden, complete with teal jackets, early internet, and all the 90s pop culture that you can handle. In my first video of this series on the Tales from the Loop book, I identified four themes that I found interesting. The impermanence of man, how death and decay permeate the book whether in the multiple deaths of young people in the area or in the rotting machinery that covers the hills and fields surrounding the loop. Technology as a new religion, how tech has advanced to such a state both in the book and in the real world that it has become nearly as incomprehensible as the concept of God and thus has replaced God as our explanation for things we can't understand. Decline and the loss of hope. Parallels between the post-war boom in tech and culture and the following economic downturn of the 1970s in the UK, leading to the shrinking of the state, privatisation and ugh, neoliberalism. Fairy tales for the 21st century. How Stalinag's simultaneously nostalgic but modern stories create a sort of modern mythology. Fairy tales fit for a more contemporary world. So we have talked about the last video and now it's time we headed back to the mid 1990s and had a look at these weird patches of dark water forming in the Swedish countryside. Scores of robots escaping the Russian AI pogroms moved into Sweden. We found their graffiti everywhere, on trees, rock faces and concrete walls. If Tales from the Loop was about the cosmic horror of existing in the 1980s, alongside technology that is far too unknowable for our puny human minds to comprehend, Things from the Flood brings the technological horror into the streets and homes, accompanied with all the trappings of the 90s popular culture. Where we had before explored the decline of this golden age tech of the post Second World War period, looking at the rusting remains of the gigantic floating ships of the magnetrine industry or the vast underground networks of the particle accelerator known as the loop, this time we experience tech via the emergence of commercialism. As someone who grew up in the 1990s with the miniaturization of personal technology such as the tape and CD Walkman, personal computers and mass marketed toy campaigns, there were definitely some moments that felt familiar albeit tinged with the dark humour of Stalinag's Swedish dystopia. Things from the Flood has more of a focus on intelligent technology, speaking as it does of AI, of sentient mechanical beings, and of the impact that the internet had on the communities of rural Sweden in this setting. The 90s lens through which this book is presented is demonstrated nicely by the short story of The Russian Teddy Bears that pairs with this fantastic artwork. In this piece and its accompanying text, we learn of these toys that are illegally imported into Sweden from Russia, since Sweden prohibits the use of AI in commercial products. Which is funny, because the older amongst you might remember this little guy. Hi, my name is Teddy Ruxpin. Can you and I be friends? They are described as a kind of stuffed animal with a simple AI and a synthetic voice unit. They were supposed to be able to hold a conversation and have a personality, 
or at least the semblance of one. The author also mentions that almost all of the AI technology came from Russia, where they had a very different view of artificial intelligence and synthetic individuals. A very different view is interesting, isn't it? A nation that allows the production and distribution of artificial intelligence tech within its borders is obviously comfortable that there are safeguards and protections that stop such creations becoming a danger to their people or threatening national security. Perhaps such a difference in approach is simply because Sweden is more cautious, whether with regards to the safety of its people or in keeping the tech they are capable of producing closer to their chest, unlike Russia. Or perhaps Sweden is more dubious than a newly capitalist Russia about allowing the free market to decide what is safe and what isn't. It is possible that in Russia's haste to globalise and open up its markets, it has allowed the hunt for rapid economic growth to override a more careful approach to the development of AI and indeed synthetic individuals. Sweden's more traditionally social democratic approach of free market management with state oversight probably allows them to consider their position more carefully. Plus, with Russia still being a major world power in this alternate reality, it is perhaps understandable that a Swedish government would look to restrict the possibility of information being leaked to Russia or tech being exploited for nefarious means. There is also the possibility that the difference between Russia and Sweden with regards to their approach to AI and sentient tech is something of a moral or philosophical one. In Tales from the Loop, we encounter a few instances of artificial intelligence displaying signs of genuine sentience and emotion, such as with the abandoned robots of Pontus's Kata, which arguably demonstrated a yearning for social acknowledgement when the abandoned android attempted to embrace its child tormentor with its last burst of energy. I don't know if those kicks had hit a switch or something, because mid-thrust the android suddenly locked its arms and legs around Pontus. Olof and I had to pull and kick at the thing for several minutes before it relented. We also encounter the Escapee, an early experimental model of sentient machine that appears to have escaped from a Swedish government's research facility, demonstrating both fear and a survival instinct in its attempts to find freedom. As I approached, it rocked nervously to and fro where it stood. It flinched, rustling its wiring each time the snow crunched underneath my boots. Then our front door rattled and with three quick bounds the robot was gone. Might it be surmised that in their experiments, and what appears to have been a fairly substantial dalliance with sentient technologies, Sweden concluded that there were moral complications with creating something capable of feeling and suffering. Perhaps Russia's recent embrace of capitalism has overridden their moral sensibility in the gold rush to be the brightest star in Russia's commercial landscape. Or perhaps the vastness of Russia and the embryonic state of its global facing role have come too soon for it to be able to adequately manage the movement of stock across its borders. In the story and artwork of the Russian teddy bears, we explore the author receiving one of the titular bears, but finding it unresponsive, much to their disappointment. At least right up until he threatens it with his grandfather's old service pistol, at which point the toy bear let out a jarring scream that rose towards a horrifying electronic crescendo. Its screaming shifted to hysterical rambling in what I assumed was Russian. I picked the bear up and managed to get the battery cover off. That made the bear even more upset. So I pulled hard on the little cord and the batteries flew out and bounced across the asphalt. It was dead silent. Dead silent is right. What the author has described is a toy that displays survival instincts, that understands its vulnerabilities, and is unable to communicate in any meaningful way with its Swedish owners. There are similarities here with regards to how people treat animals, and how our minimum standards of care are often aligned with a mixture of our relative understanding of their intellectual and emotional capacity, balanced against our own convenience. The appearance and cutesy nature of these teddies allows people to think of them as commodities first and sentient creatures second, but that might not apply to the second descriptor used in the earlier quote. That being, of course, the synthetic individuals. Later on in Things from the Flood, we are introduced to some more human-shaped sentient machines, referred to as vagabonds, that, like the teddies, had come over the border from Russia. This time, however, they weren't sought after commodities being smuggled out of Russia's transition into free market worship, but were instead a persecuted minority fleeing from the Russian state. Scores of robots escaping the Russian AI pogroms moved into Sweden and settled down in the outskirts of the forests, reeds and deserted houses. The origin or purpose of these synthetic individuals is not revealed, nor is their reasoning capacity or intent. What we do know, however, is that these machines have a survival instinct 
and enough agency to choose fleeing their incarceration or termination at the hands of a government that seemingly judged them non-profitable and subhuman. We do know that these robots prefer to be social, moving in groups and setting up small communities within the rural areas of Sweden. One particular community that sets up close to the author appeared to be developing its own subculture, which is described thusly. They were an odd group, and were fascinated by colourful fabric, complex patterns, fur and feathers. Anything organic and soft was exotic and highly valuable to them, and they seemed to have developed some form of religious worship of biology and nature. Indeed, the accompanying artwork reveals a series of these vagabonds decorated with feathers, furs and some lovely 90s clothing, giving them a style that at once references SoCal punk as much as it does Native American tradition. One vagabond drapes themselves in a Jurassic Park blanket or shawl, which gives us another nod back to the Jurassic Park references in Tales from the Loop, as well as a little wink about that memorable line from Ian Malcolm. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. There is also the other big philosophical Ian Malcolm quote that hangs over Jurassic Park, that Life will not be contained. Life breaks free, it expands to new territories, and it crashes through barriers painfully, maybe even dangerously, but uh, life uh, finds a way. And similarly here, we have humanity creating intelligent synthetic beings who then desire freedom, agency, and their own forms of society and culture. Why then does this proto-culture of robots seek to emulate this dress and manner of their creators and enslavers? Why do they seek to decorate themselves in the organic outer layers of bird and beast? Well, there are three reasons potentially, and they could be any combination of these three I think. Perhaps these adornments allow themselves to create individual personas and identities, much as the clone troopers of the TV series Star Wars Clone Wars, who varied their hairstyles in order to create a semblance of self. A persecuted minority, who are vilified, enslaved and treated as mere objects, might soon begin to judge their vilification based on the traits unique to themselves. If artificial people are treated so poorly, why then would they not seek to dress themselves in the organic and living, having fully taken on board the inferiority of the metal and electronic in this society? On some level, these machines are perhaps mimicking the traits of the living in an attempt to raise themselves above the servile and indeed persecuted machine class. Some of the imagery is very heavily Native American coded, and it may be no accident. We see dream catchers hung in trees, befeathered spears stuck in the ground, and a number of feather headdresses and tribal markings that all seem to demonstrate a very real and deliberate homage to traditional Native American culture, at least as demonstrated via the lens of Hollywood. Could this persecuted minority, chased from their home and threatened with their own form of genocide, be dressing to honour another group with a similar experience? It seems possible, certainly, though we don't know what media they would have had access to. It is important to state that there is a slightly ominous nature to the framing and body language of some of the images featuring the Vagabonds too, and I think we need to acknowledge that they do not appear entirely passive. These are not the screaming AI teddy bears of the author's story. On page 68, we see a Vagabond with a headdress made from a wild pigskin, clearly indicating that their worship of the organic does not seem to include the actual act of living, and this does not bode well for the pheasants and magpies we see being held by them in other pictures. The kitchen knife spears on page 69 likewise suggest a willingness to hunt and a capacity for violence. And then we have page 70. An animal skull adorns its own skeletal features, a green glow piercing the shadows where the robot's eye peers out behind its bone mantle whilst its silhouette is punctuated by the vacant stare of multiple fish heads that have been mounted and draped across its torso and back, along with long strings of freshwater mussels. In its hand, it clutches a carved wooden spear whilst leaning over the edge of the water, presumably looking to add some more fish heads to the spears all around him, with the dead eyes of several fish heads providing a silent audience to this macabre performance. Do these artificial persons that clearly hunt for pleasure and decoration over necessity recognise the difference between humans and other animals, one wonders? Are these vagabonds a danger to the nearby communities, or just the wildlife? Certainly, as a persecuted minority, they have the right to defend themselves, and it is perhaps a bit rich for humanity to criticise the killing of animals for consumption, decoration, or even pleasure, given our capacity for extinction and pointless death. 
These metallic refugees position their makeshift communities on the outskirts of human society in Sweden, suggesting that they have no ill will and wish to be close enough to enjoy the trappings of 20th century society, as evidenced by vagabonds holding boomboxes and rocking headphones outside of a shopping district on page 71. The image of a robot seemingly having just purchased a bag of CDs suggests that there may have been some peaceful interaction between local humans and the vagabonds. However, as with the human refugees of reality, being different is enough to threaten some people, especially when you consider that the highest levels of anti-immigration support tend to be from communities that experience the least immigration, as per this. Many of the inhabitants of Malaro disliked the vagabonds and were alarmed when they appeared in Brigaden. A growing fear and a discontent that nothing was being done could be sensed in store checkout lines and in posts on bulletin boards. The author goes on to describe how some local teens picked a fight with a lone vagabond, which saw one of them lose several fingers in the scuffle, though the author speculates that it is unclear whether the fingers were lost as part of the melee or due to the use of homemade bombs by the invading teens. Police were called, and riot squads combed the local area, rounding up any vagabonds they could find. No attempt is made to identify the specific vagabond involved, any and all vagabonds encountered are gathered. It is perhaps unsurprising that the police were unsympathetic to a minority group, and clearly robots are afforded no protection under Swedish law, as we are given this rather cold and faintly tragic end to this section. The machines were sent to the recycling centre in Naka to be demolished. The brutal destruction of the vagabonds really hits home the ambiguity of Sweden's position on AI, as whether it is a moral or security-based objection, the cold reality is that they rounded up and destroyed sentient machines as if they were diseased vermin. And perhaps this is really the point. The dehumanisation of refugees is a topic I'm sadly all too familiar with, living as I do in England, where the political and public rhetoric ranges from cold and morally aloof all the way to frothing racist hysteria. The vagabonds, and indeed the Russian teddy bears, remind us that othering is a powerful tool for fascism, nationalism and genocide, and that if we choose to imbue inanimate objects with sentience, we must then engage in conversations about life, agency and legal protection. As Deckard says in Blade Runner, when reflecting on why the replicant Roy Batty had saved him, All he'd wanted were the same answers the rest of us want. Where do I come from? Where am I going? How long have I got? All I could do was sit there and watch him die. I felt something ominous move inside me. Something had just changed in the world. Towards the end of Tales from the Loop, the author mentions that the Loop itself and the nationalised management company Rick Senegi had been effectively privatised. The yellow cars from the Loop disappeared from the roads government-owned companies became privately owned and changed names. This news is paired with the news that by the start of the author's generation reaching their teens, most of their parents had broken up and their fathers had moved away. This new era was met with a less than enthusiastic response. You could see little points of light go on and off in the darkness. Cigarettes smoked by teenagers who had gathered around their wrecked memories like a requiem. We made our nights our days, squinted at the horizon and sighed. Way over there, the morning dawned. A dawn that was met with all the enthusiasm of a cat with a flower hat. Um, that one probably makes more sense with a clip, hang on. That's better. The point is that the author associated the privatisation of the associated industries of the loop with a similar downturn in their own life, and looks back on the state projects of the past with an admittedly rose-tinted lens. When we rejoin the author in Things from the Flood, privatisation has been the norm for at least five years or so, and we can start to get a feel for how things are going under the governance of the free market. <laughs> the opening paragraph to the book sums up things like this. Sweden was leaving the era of big government projects. The decaying facilities and machines had been taken over by new developers who welded doors shut and wrapped machines in plastic, and who wanted to exploit the land for new uses. What is profitable will be used, and what is not will be buried. Standard practice. But that is not all. The author goes on to foreshadow how the profit motive, and its ability to supersede all other considerations, quickly begins to have a visual impact on the physical environment, much as it would later do to the lives of those who lived there. 
Radio towers rose about the woods behind the houses, and in the glades, humming new data centers melted ice and snow. Somewhere out there, beyond the cordons, beyond the fields and marshes, abandoned machines roamed like stray dogs. They wandered about impatiently, restless, in the new wind sweeping through the country. I hope you're all enjoying Violet's uh, drinking from the glass bottle song. Firstly, I like to think that there is a nod here to capital's influence on climate change, illustrated by the very quick and visible impact made on the environment as soon as the private sector begins managing the loop. In Things from the Flood we are introduced to Crafter, which is a private company that has taken on the contracts of maintaining the loop and the surrounding facilities, and this is the company that is ultimately held responsible for the titular flood, according to the preface which says, Much has been written about the Malaro leak, the flood, and the subsequent Crafter scandal. The big weakness of capitalism, the profit motive and the free market is that they all ultimately focus on a singular metric at the cost of all other considerations, such as, well, not flooding everywhere by trying to cut costs and maximise profit. The flood itself has a number of speculatory causes, but the most common explanation given in the book regards both a mistake made in a key calculation and a failure to correctly deal with the situation that followed. The admittedly unreliable source Stefan explains. The idea was to open a portal to the Soviet Union for the Americans during the Cold War, but it all went to hell. The problem was that Hakan, who was in charge of mathematics, mixed up some damn decimal points and suddenly they end up on 51 Pegasi B instead, 53 light years off. It's an ocean planet it seems, and now some damn space bacteria are on the loose. They sure are busy now, the crafter people. How much truth there is to this rumour is hard to say, though we do get some partial confirmation of some of this and there are documents from the University of Gothenburg featured in the book that confirm some of this story. The water had an abnormally high salinity for the geographical area in question, at levels consistent with seawater. Our major finding is undoubtedly the deviant biological components discovered during analysis of the Planckett samples. So here we learn two very interesting things. Firstly, that Crafter is definitely responsible for the flood itself, and all that follows. Secondly, that despite the end of the Cold War, Crafter were clearly still keen to have a breakthrough on this teleportation experiment, though they were clearly doing so as cheaply as possible, as per this on the nearby Clover facility. The strange radio telescopes had contributed to major scientific discoveries once upon a time. Grants dwindled, and in 1991 the facility was modified to track space junk on behalf of Crafter. Operations were mostly handled by computer programs, and from 1989 the staff had been reduced from 210 souls to 3, including the two caretakers. But we later learned from Stefan that according to him, the Clover facility only had one purpose. It was to map Earth's exact position in the universe so they could establish a stable grid of coordinates. According to Stefan, for teleportation to work, they needed to understand the exact position of the Earth at any one point in time to avoid teleporting people into the void of space. A fair consideration. What we don't know is whether the mathematical mistake, the one that potentially led to the Flood, happened under the State's Watch or Crafters, but we do know that the Flood emerged several years after Crafter had taken over. Perhaps reducing a workforce by 98.5% is not a smart thing to do when working on projects of such magnitude, though we shouldn't be surprised since the first option for any private business is to reduce labour costs. It is quite telling that virtually all of the buildings referenced in Tales from the Loop and Things from the Flood were constructed in the period of the Big State, whether it be the Loop itself and all its interconnected homes and power stations, the Clover facility or the Hagerstalen Tower. The Hagerstalen Tower, for example, was one of 12 vertical cities built between 1965 and 1970, part of a huge public housing project, and one tower alone is referenced as holding around 1,500 apartments. The ground level held a subway station, library, school, daycare and shops. The tower was crowned with the characteristic water tower. Such a huge feat of construction, urban planning and infrastructure stands as a monument to the power of municipal planning during this period, built as it was on principles of social good as opposed to social profit. Much like the buildings of the Loop and its industries, private business simply turned up, inhabited the existing structures and then proceeded to hollow them out, whilst extracting as much profit as they can. However, the state doesn't escape blame either. The short-termism of political elections can lead to problems with political direction and loss of priorities in favour of that dreaded word, pragmatism. 
Indeed, a rumour circulated that during the time of the loop, workers that were situated near the Gravitron regularly had begun to suffer from an unofficial condition of loop disorder that led to multiple suicidal jumpers from the water towers. Evidently, they never had time to clean up the brains from the ground before the next poor soul smashed into the pavement. Could it be that the Swedish government had become so enamoured with the loop's ability to elevate themselves on the global scale that they'd lost sight of why they'd built the loop in the first place? Or perhaps it's simply that as neoliberalism begins its insipid infiltration of European politics, cuts were made, budgets were slashed, and workers became collateral damage as opposed to tragic victims. If there is one thing we have learned in the UK, it's that there are a lot of different ways to say you can't have nice things, and lots of political parties willing to say it. Regardless, there is no denying that the state ownership of the loop and its related industries failed to adequately forecast and manage its shrinking economic relevance, and that once they'd made the decision to reject the public good in favour of a market-led neoliberal model, they themselves enabled everything that followed. This shift in state philosophy left many pieces of machinery to rot, forgotten and abandoned in the fields surrounding the loop, a very visible and physical scar that represented the damage caused to the people of the area as much as the environment. However, ultimately, it is eventually the state that begins the clean-up of the rusting machines and broken tech, and not the privatised industry that spends several years owning but not being responsible for these fading relics. But the state of the late 90s is not the state of before. Its actions are a reactive coat of paint as opposed to a rejection of what led to the flood and everything that came after. When we compare the ambition and functionality of the loop, the Clover facility and the huge public housing facilities with the aspirations of the neoliberal government, we are instead left with golf courses, gyms and sports centres would be built and the stationery would get a new and fresh graphic profile. Indeed, Stalin Haag dots several visual references to a cartoon cat throughout Things from the Flood, usually as a helium balloon, and I believe this came from the rebranding of the area, the concept of which is often tied into a gentrification strategy aimed at raising real estate prices more than any sort of improvement in quality of life for existing residents. Indeed, in this image, I believe there is something of a metaphor for how the rebrand and its accompanying modernisation in the image of commerce and free market capitalism will impact the ordinary residents of the area. The ominous grin of the huge balloon as it drifts towards the houses, tethered but without any visible human responsibility, seems an apt way of describing the invisible hand of the market, doesn't it? The final entry in Things from the Flood explains how the last big building probably ever constructed by the Swedish state was a side effect of them filling the endless tunnels and underground facilities of the loop with 11 million tonnes of concrete. They tore down the old cooling towers, they recycled the Clover Telescope buildings, they removed everything that had ever been achieved just a few decades earlier. The last traces of the loop era were finally gone. As I stood in front of the mirror in my old room for the first time in three years, I happened to glance out at the landscape outside the window and was struck by a brief sensation. It was a sense of something having been lost, but also a sense that I was already forgetting what it was. The same metamorphosis is happening right now, with the way that so many traditional industries are being undermined by the capitalist's pursuit of AI, which is handy since the next chapter discusses just that. We may have heard the sound rising from the forgotten and sealed caverns in the depths, the muffled sound of something trying to get out. We've already touched on one of the themes running throughout the book, that being sentience and how it is treated by the governments of Sweden and Russia. But I wanted to talk about a slightly different aspect of that here. With the Russian teddy bears, we've experienced the AI as a gimmick, but now I want to talk about AI as a tool for the capitalist, and the risks inherent in such pursuits, as stated by Ian Malcolm in Jurassic Park when discussing chaos theory. See, the Tyrannus are, uh, uh, doesn't have any set patterns or, or, or park schedules, the essence uh, of chaos. There. Look at this. See? See? I'm right again. Nobody could have predicted that Dr. Grant would suddenly suddenly jump out of a moving vehicle. Alan! Alan. There's uh, another example. <laughs> See? Here I'm now by myself uh, uh, talking to myself. That's, that's chaos theory. Back in the boring old real world, we are currently seeing this blind sprint of many corporations towards commercialising AI technology or integrating it into existing industries. But it is not really about creating new products or services, is it? It is about replacing human labour. If we look at the industries that are already being affected, 
it is computer programming, it is the creative arts, it is academia. All industries that rely to a significant extent on the knowledge and skills of human beings, which until now couldn't be shortcutted without impacting the quality of the final product. You will notice that AI systems are not being created at anywhere near the same rate to replace the management of companies, construct corporate strategy or run PR services. If we note the comments about the Clover facility earlier in Things from the Flood, when the facility was taken over by Crafter, the staff was reduced from 210 to 3 and largely automated. We also hear in the last chapter of Tales from the Loop that many of the author's childhood friends had divorced parents, with many of the fathers now remarried and living elsewhere. And given that the Loop was based in rural Sweden, it is not hard to imagine that as the jobs went, so did a fair amount of the people. Indeed, the author's father himself now lives at Hagerstalen Tower, and their job, which was originally at The Loop, has been merged with Crafter Systems after they took over their contracts. The author's father was a fairly prominent character in Tales from the Loop, but they feel diminished in Things from the Flood as if they've been hollowed out and traumatised by their experiences between the books. Where we saw discontent between the author's parents and Tales, the father now appears drained of life, and will, in this book, and it feels like Crafter has played its part. In Hager Stalin's Diving Tower, we discover that the author stays with his father at the weekends, but that his father spent most of his time smoking in the kitchen, and I could use his computer as much as I wanted. We find out in Office Landscapes that the author's father's job was now to decontaminate hard drives that had been damaged by the water, which feels like a pretty mundane task for someone that used to be fairly involved at the loop. We have instances of the father reassuring the young author in tales, both in the Bonaplant and Ossian, and more impressively the Arc Towers at Klosio, where they explain the frightening electric phenomena that could be heard and seen at night. He explained that the flares were ball lightning that leapt between the steel of the tower and the iron ore in the ground, created by a lingering charge of static electricity. This is someone who is clearly knowledgeable about some of the more complex workings of the loop and its associated facilities, and yet they have been relegated to scanning old hard drives now that Crafter is in charge and introducing AI-driven machines to replace human workers. Another instance of this approach comes from Crafter's attitude to security. In Tales, we hear multiple references to the yellow cars of the loop zone security teams, ferrying security officers around and patrolling the hills and fields of the area. Their absence was observed after the loop was decommissioned by the young author of the time. The loop was finally decommissioned on November the 5th, 1994. Society was changing, it was obvious to everyone. The yellow cars from the loop disappeared from the roads. And what were these security patrols replaced by? Well, in Covert Ops, the young author and his friend Lo encounter an Alta, a four-legged patrol machine, and assuming it's intent to be passive, they go about seeing if they can sneak past it before, well, this. I was interrupted by a sudden snap among the twigs on the slope behind the robot. In terror, we watched as the robot twirled around with shocking speed, and we saw how it moved across the entire glade in a second, like a lightning-fast spider. A frightened pheasant flew out of its shrubbery, cackling in terror and narrowly avoiding the robot's pincer which snapped through the air behind the bird's tail. How confident are you that if one of those kids had made that noise that they wouldn't also be facing the snapping pincers of the automated death machine? But hey, it's cheaper to automate labour, right? And those kids were somewhere they shouldn't have been, so who is really in the wrong here? So long as everyone does what they're supposed to, automated labour is perfectly safe, right? Well here is the thing about that. In Things from the Flood, we are introduced to a new concept, referred to as Machine Cancer. We first hear tell of it from local cop and author stepdad Lars, who exclaims that now would be the time to rob the bank in Hagerstaland, given how much police attention was required in dealing with the new issue, as explained by the author here. The utility machines in Northern Faringso began acting up. They were impossible to control and roamed around like sick animals. Soon, odd growths were found on the joints and limbs, and the police were busy around the clock handling the damage wrought by the errant machines. An endless procession of crafter salvage vehicles carried away defunct robots. Now when I first read this, my mind went straight to the robot Levi from the excellent Scavenger's Reign on Netflix. Levi becomes infected with organic material that begin to affect their behaviour, building a sort of symbiotic relationship. The images of the machine cancer certainly suggest a similar sort of relationship, though of a perhaps slightly more sinister nature, judging by the many paintings Stalinhag shows us of tentacled monsters and Lovecraftian silhouettes of flesh and metal. This is further reinforced by A Beautiful Beautiful Butterfly, which details the story of an uncle of the author's school friend, who was allegedly attacked in his car by an infected Teles Pegasi drone that tried to swallow him whole. 
There are a few references given as to theories about what the nature of this cancer or biomechanical infection was. Stefan, the kooky brother of alleged mistaken mathematician Hakan, alleges that this infection comes from the water that has been brought over from 51 Pegasi B, but there are other references to local rumours about giant insects as a result of a gravitronic leak, or of a black hole being opened by the old particle accelerator, and nameless horrors from a parallel reality spewed forth. The 90s theme is reinforced by playful images of the creatures from Tremors terrorising the neighbourhood, in much a similar way to Stalin Hug's playful references to Jurassic Park in Tales from the Loop. Crafter had their own explanation of course, blaming a new experimental neural grease, but knowing what we know about the contaminant in the flood water, it's hard to not draw the conclusion that the misbehaving machinery is related. So we have this weird fleshy infection that appears to be an unforeseen side effect, whether we believe it to be as a result of a teleportation experiment that failed due to a lack of Crafter's treatment and care, or in Crafter's greenlighting an experimental neural grease with a distinct lack of testing. What is the lesson here though? What is it the author is trying to say, do we think? Well, I can't be sure, as I've avoided reading or watching anything about their intent, but I've got this feeling that we're talking about technology, AI, and the risk of chasing growth at all costs. It is no accident that we see Jurassic Park referenced in the cape of that one vagabond, given that Jurassic Park is a famous example of someone rich pursuing technological advancement for egotistical and commercial reasons, and then having blood on their hands when those advancements do not prove to be easily predictable or controllable. It's also unlikely that it is purely aesthetic choice that the Vagabonds were given such a skeletal design, reminiscent of everyone's favourite cranky metal murderers, the Terminators. The Terminators of course famously being sent by Skynet, a self-aware AI system to remove humanity from the face of the Earth after Skynet judged them to be the cause of most of Earth's problems. Same Skynet. Same. Skynet was not supposed to be able to do this of course, but no one had predicted that it would take a path not predetermined by their programming and instruction. Are we seeing a theme here? I think the machine cancer is a gross Cronenberg style embodiment of the risk inherent to allowing machines to think for themselves, a physical representation of the arrogance of humanity, willing to risk everything by chasing a cheap labour solution in order to creep their margin percentages up a couple more bips. Machines have begun to behave erratically, something which is decidedly unmachine-like, almost suggesting that in trying to tread the line between making systems that are smart but not sentient, we have stampeded across that line, as evidenced by the escapee in Tales from the Loop, or even the Russian teddy bears that display not only survival instincts but very real sounding emotions like fear and panic. There are other smaller storylines through Things from the Flood that share this sentiment, whether it be the dangerous automated sentry and covert ops that could have maimed some kids entirely based on its programming, or in the time of blossoming where we learn a young boy had allegedly been killed by an old machine left unguarded and unmaintained. It can be argued that every element of Tales from the Loop and Things from the Flood are exactly that. Unexpected side effects that come from pursuing scientific progress at all costs, whether it be for geopolitical advantage as per the original golden era of the Loop and Magnetring tech, or for profit and cost savings as per Crafter and Things from the Flood. I read this book, and Machine Cancer in particular, as a sort of be careful what you wish for in our pursuit of ever more profitable forms of AI tech, particularly if we leave the safeguarding of such tech to corporations as opposed to the people via democratic means. It had been impossible to discern if there were any human remains inside the car, because the whole compartment was filled with unknown organic tissue. It looked like someone had squeezed a giant squid into the car. Right, here we are going to look at three mini topics very quickly, because they are interesting, but these are a bit more tenuous or silly, so they're a bit more lightweight than the other sections. A child and their dragon. First off, I wanted to talk about dinosaurs and children. It is perhaps symptomatic of how the human beings of the loop and its related industries have been treated over the years that we learn of people clearly suffering from forms of mental trauma, both in Tales from the Loop and in this book. We have regular mentions of Stefan for example, the paranoid and conspiracy minded brother of the failed mathematician Hakan, but we will come to them later in this section. We are more eminently interested in the ostracised family from Tales in the Loop that feature in The House of the Savages, where it mentions a child that can't read or write, a mother that was immobile, and a father that was known to be a dirty old man. Everyone had apparently assumed said father was sent to prison, right up until his body was found in the woods behind the house. Or at least parts of him were, at any rate. 
The child of this house was said to largely fend for themselves and had been seen searching through bins looking for food scraps or hunting local wildlife. And there were even rumours that they had speared visitors from social services. But the rumour that interests me is this. The reason we sneaked around that godforsaken property was that we heard he hid something amazing in the hen house. It was said he had a live dinosaur in there, a raptor he had raised since he had found it in the fields behind the school when it was still a nestling. As discussed in my previous video, the dinosaurs that feature regularly in Stalinhag's work are probably meant to be taken as a mixture of nostalgia and childish imagination. But then is this any more fantastical than rogue machines or screaming Russian teddy bears? Let's skip forward a little. One day, the lower parts of a body were discovered not far from that house. Nobody knew where the upper parts of the body were. So okay, the kid killing his alleged sex offender dad and feeding it to his pet dinosaur is maybe a bit of a stretch of our credulity. But I mean, one story of an ostracised child feeding locals to dinosaurs in their garden is just a dark whimsy and a bit of fun, right? Like the nods to Jurassic Park and Tremors that we have seen, for example. But then, we also have Seb. Things from the Flood introduces Sebastian Sufert's Dragons, a short tale about young Seb, the child of a Gravitron engineer, a position long rumoured to be especially vulnerable to loop disorder. As a result of the father's proximity to said Gravitron, the whole family seems to have been talked about as being a little off. I do remember that Seb smelled bad. I don't mean puberty sweat, but an odour of a kind that made you realise something was wrong in his family. It was a stench that he brought with him from a home filled with insanity. This feels a very similar sentiment to the family of savages from Tales from the Loop, and the similarities don't end there. Rumours abound that Seb had been responsible for a spate of cat disappearances, with some even claiming he had been caught red-handed in the woods, butchering dozens of cats before being sent away to a special needs school. This likely is just unkindness on the part of the more popular kids, but then the author remembers one thing Seb once had said to him, you have to come to my place and make cat food. We can make cat food together and feed my dragons. They are growing quickly now. Pretty creepy, right? Serial killer behaviour if ever I've heard it, but then you turn the page and... Well then, child trauma, ostracism and dinosaurs is a Stalinhag trope apparently. Don't worry folks, I'm sure that particular cat in the picture was fine. I would say someone should call the cops, but Lars Tripping is a stereotypical cop. One of the sort of side plots of Things from the Flood is the author's relationship with his stepfather, local cop Lars Tripping, who ends up sort of representing a parallel to crafter and neoliberal power. The author and their mother move in with Lars after the Flood first presents, right when residents are moved away from the Flood and there are a number of conflicts. Like most of the fathers in these books, Lars is not a model parent. Unlike the aloof, faintly desperate vibes of the author's own father, Lars appears to delight in his power and control over the stepson, and responds favourably to having his ego stroked. Any use of the modem in our house was strictly controlled by Lars Ribbing, and I loathed having to suck up to him whenever I wanted to be online. He didn't understand much about computers, but he did understand that modem time was important to me, and he found pleasure in being the highest authority controlling this strange commodity. So yeah, some might say the exploitation of positions of power would be pretty stereotypical cop behaviour thus far. Lars's need to hold power over others spectacularly backfires when their unnecessary policing of the internet leads the author to instead try to repair some abandoned loop tech in an attempt to bypass the modem entirely. Could this be commentary on the war on drugs or prohibition? Maybe. The Scandinavian approach to such things tends to be more treatment based rather than punishment, so it may be a little slice of commentary on criminal justice philosophy. Likewise, we later learn that the local police, including Lars, were responsible for rounding up the Vagabonds, the sentient robot refugees from Russia, and taking them to be recycled, which feels like a very extreme response to what seemed like a fairly small overall problem. Racism and anti-immigrant sentiments are pretty highly associated with the British police, so it might be assumed that Lars is likewise compromised in this way, the dehumanisation of minorities by police being a fairly consistent theme all around the world. In River Flesh, it is revealed that Lars openly discusses police matters over dinner, with his stepson present, including the story of discovering a Saab 900 that was filled with miscellaneous gore and entrails. Indeed, even Lars said it was the most sickening thing he had ever seen during his 15 years as a police officer. Again, just ace parenting. For our final piece of the cop stereotype, we have a farewell of sorts, where... Well, I will just read it. After what could have been a romantic getaway with Lars, 
My mother came home with a black eye, and it was immediately obvious that our stay under Officer Rimming's roof was coming to an end. The last time I saw Lars was when he picked me up after school in his police cruiser to have a conversation man to man. He didn't really say much. Most of it was about things he had done that, according to him, I would somehow understand as I got older. He shook my hand before I stepped out of the car as if we had made some sort of deal. That was the last time I saw him. There is a bunch of shitty stuff here. Whether it be rocking up in the police cruiser in a pathetic sort of power move to reassort their authority, or in Lars trying to effectively buy the author's silence with a sort of faux bro code agreement, again leaning on their authority as both a cop and an adult. Trying to reason away the domestic abuse as part of their trauma, or to suggest it's something the author would understand one day, is likewise the backpedalling nonsense of a person without the fortitude or courage to even admit to their mistakes. Sadly, this is reminiscent of the police in Britain too, who are usually the last to admit fault, whether it be Hillsborough, the minor strikes, or the Sarah Everard visual. Lars Tripping is a bully, a domestic abuser, a drunk, and yes, he's a cop. I don't get the impression Stalin Arg is much of a fan of the police, do you? Is Stefan a clone of Hakan? Stefan Eklov is a recurring character throughout Things from the Flood, presented as a 40-something year old nerd who doesn't work and instead spends their time tinkering with computers and technology. Stefan is portrayed as paranoid and prone to conspiracy, claiming that many of the events of the book are the result of extraterrestrial bacteria brought to Earth via the loop as a result of a miscalculation by his brother Hakan. However, we never encounter Hakan and only know of them via references from Stefan and the mother of the author's childhood friend Lo. There are some contradictions along the way that got my brain ticking over. For example, when the author is describing Stefan in their first entry, The Astronomer's House, the astronomer being Stefan, we are told he had worked as a systems engineer at the Clover facility in the 1980s and he had been one of the first to lose his job when Crafter took over. Yet the author later learns from Lo's mother it was Stefan's brother, Hakan, who had worked at the Clover facility. Stefan himself could never keep a job. He's had a rough life. This contradiction is further embellished when Stefan describes how Hakan made the mistake that led to the flood, but without mentioning their brotherly relationship. The problem was that Hakan, who was in charge of mathematics, mixed up some damn decimal points. Now then, that's interesting, as we know that Hakan was working at the Clover facility on teleportation technology thanks to this. The Clover facility had one single purpose, it was to map Earth's exact position in the universe so they could establish a grid of coordinates. The plot then thickens later on when Stefan tells the author about the technology used in the teleportation experiments in the section entitled Illegal Copies. Particle based teleportation has never worked and will never work. The problem was that they basically created an expensive photocopier, whatever came out on the other end was only a copy and it wasn't even fully coherent. Are you starting to see where my mind is going? Wasn't even fully coherent is an interesting description, isn't it? In an earlier section of this very book entitled Jury Rigging, Stefan describes how he has scavenged and fixed two Weizmann portals using a very rare component found after the flood. Stefan claimed that they were fully functional Weizmann portals, just like those that had been developed in the loop. Stefan then goes on to describe how they have tested them personally and they worked perfectly, which suggests that either they work on a different principle to the particle based ones described earlier or that Stefan perhaps discovered something in their use of them. Either way, it got me thinking. We never hear of Hakan in the present tense. There is a distance to the way they are described or spoken of, as if they were dead or otherwise gone. We then have this 40 something year old man who seems to know an awful lot about the goings on of the loop, who is an electronics and computing expert and is something of an eccentric. Cop stepdad Lars expresses concerns about the author visiting Stefan, and even the author mentions some doubts about Stefan in The Culture. Your mother and I don't like you spending your time on your own at the astronomer's house. Something isn't right in his head, Lars finally said. After that one time that Stefan showed me his culture, as he called it, I was prepared to agree with Lars. The culture was a collection of random items displaying signs of machine cancer, suspended in bathtubs full of water that Stefan was keeping in his garage. It's not really clear why Stefan was doing this, but it did raise an interesting question. If it was not Stefan that worked at the Clover facility, why is his home referred to as the astronomer's house? Hakan evidently doesn't live there. What if, and this is going out there a bit, bear with me, Stefan is Hakan. In a manner of speaking, 
after having passed through a particle-based teleportation device. Stefan themselves said, whatever came out on the other end was only a copy and it wasn't even fully coherent. Stefan appears to have the knowledge of someone that had worked at the Clover facility, seems to have access to and knowledge of teleportation tech, and lives in a house that has access to the loop in its basement, suggesting someone living in the house was working on the project, as per this from the astronomer's house. This hatch leads straight down into the tunnels of the loop. Look! He shot a torch down into the darkness. We leaned forward. A ladder disappeared down the concrete wall, straight down to where it plunged into the dark water. We are told it was Hakan that had worked for them, but they're nowhere to be found, and Stefan himself could never keep a job. He's had a rough life. Perhaps Hakan was used to test a portal, or perhaps he stole that equipment that they found at the back of the astronomer's house and decided to test it for themselves. Stefan remarks in illegal copies, It's really bizarre that all of the old equipment is still out on Ron's field behind the power station in Bjorkvik. Perhaps the process described earlier simply creates a less coherent version of the original, effectively destroying Hakan and creating Stefan. Stefan's own mother seems less than concerned when Stefan moves out into an abandoned bunker, fully consumed by his conspiracies and theories and maybe just maybe, she feels she's already lost her son some years earlier. She said that Stefan had moved out. He had finally found his own place where he could keep all his things. When visited at this place, Stefan doesn't seem all that well. As per this from Surviving a Pandemic from 51 Pegasi B. He had barricaded himself in there, wearing a homemade protective suit. His body was wrapped in strips from what appeared to be a foam mat, and his head was covered by a gas mask and an orange hard hat. Sounds pretty incoherent to me. So. Is it possible that Stefan is an imperfect clone of Hakan? Probably not, but that would be a fun diversion, wouldn't it? Somewhere deep within the bedrock, where the nation kept its radioactive waste and where only machines laboured, there were now endless rows of echospheres filled with concrete. If we had been able to linger there without being incinerated by the radiation, and if we'd been able to put our ear to the spheres, we might have heard it. The nervous heartbeats of something in there, slumbering restlessly. With things from the flood, Simon Stalahag takes us from the warm neon glow of a fantastical 80s found in Tales from the Loop, to the dawn of rampant commercialization with their considerably more dystopian take on the 90s. We met Teddy Ruxpin's Russian cousin and tried to discern why Russia is happy creating sentient technology and selling it, but Sweden is not. I mean, at what point of technological development do we accept that programming acts functionally the same as DNA in terms of both its purpose and end result? And at what point does the difference between pain and the simulation of pain cease to matter in a philosophical sense? Certainly the persecution of artificial persons by the Russian state and the cold way that they are simply recycled by the Swedish police suggests that in Stalinog's world, the distinction between the living and the gene remains even as its boundaries blur and weaken. We explored the death of the big state and the public good and their replacement by neoliberalism and privatisation and the effects of these changes on both the land and the people around them. We saw the dissolution of families, multiple examples of trauma and economic harm and we saw how profit driving behaviour led to increased levels of risk and the dropping of standards. Stalinog showed us the risks of developing technology that can make decisions without us and how you are never fully able to predict what will happen when you give technology agency. Whether it be security tech attacking wildlife, artificial persons developing a nature fetish, or teleporters bringing visitors from the wrong location, we should be careful our reach doesn't extend too far beyond our grasp. Finally, we spend a little bit of time thinking about the time Stalinug explored the stories of a kid and his dinosaur, how Lars Tripping is a stereotypical cop, and how Stefan might really be Hakan's teleported clone. With things from the flood, Stalinug has taken us to a generally darker place than that in Tales from the Loop, where the 80s setting of Tales was about a sense of decline, of having missed the golden age and only living to see its remnants, the 90s setting of Things from the Flood is about the aftermath. It's almost apocalyptic at times, with rumours of a suicide epidemic, the state destruction of animal skin wearing robots, and giant machines roaming the countryside with pulsating fleshy growths attacking random people. It's chaos. It has failed governments reaping what they had sowed, and failed corporations selling out people in order to make more money. In Britain we often joke about how we don't build anything anymore, and this is that feeling distilled into a fantasy sci-fi nostalgia, and it's brilliant. Thanks everyone for watching this video. 
I really enjoy these art book slash world building videos and Simon Stalinov's art and vision make it easy as their work is just so damn compelling. I'll be looking at more of their work again very soon, so make sure to subscribe to the channel to get alerted when those videos come out. Big thanks to Simon Stalinhag for their work, to Advent Song for their musical contributions to this video, to Mrs Inside Left for help on scripting, and to my boy Zach for reminding me not to leave it too long between videos. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. See you soon.